Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that will bear fruit in its season, and his leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Greetings to you. Good evening. Hello. How are you? Pastor Sam May here with Deliverance Bible Church, Tacoma, Washington, and we're so glad that uh, you uh, tuned in, came in, channeled in to be with us on this hour, Word Alive, our Bible study time. We uh, call this time of the week Word Alive. We say often that the world calls it hump day. It's the middle of the work week, Monday through Friday, but this is Word Alive, um, God's Word. Uh, not just on Sunday, but also on Wednesday and whatever other days that you might tune in to get this broadcast because we do leave it um, so that you can get to it later. We're on DBC Tacoma Facebook, DBC Tacoma YouTube. Of course, you already know that because that's how you got here. But I just remind you that you can also get the broadcast later if the Wednesday evening doesn't work out for you. Then there's other times you can listen to the broadcast and you can also encourage others to listen to the broadcast that can't get it on Wednesday nights also. Anyway, hey, glad you're here. Glad you made it. Another day God has kept us. Another day God has been good and blessed us and uh, showed his mercy. His mercies were new this morning and his grace was sufficient for today. So we, we thank him and we uh, can't speak well enough of him, enough of him. Because uh, whatever we have, whatever we are, we is not because of us, but because of his love for us, his giving his son for us, that we might have eternal life with him. That's the awesome God that we have, as great as he is. He cares about you, and he cares about me, and we can't thank him enough. As a matter of fact, if you haven't thanked him today, Give him a thanks right now, uh, whatever time of day you're watching this broadcast. Give him thanks right now because he's a good God. He's been good to you. He has he has watched over you. He has kept his word in your life. Let me tell you something. I got to go. The enemy had plans for you, and God said, not so. You got a sound mind. Claim your sound mind. You have stable emotions. Claim your stable emotions. The word of God wants your emotions to be stable the Word of God wants your mind to be sound, so stop talking that negative stuff over your life. Claim the Word of God, sound mind, and stable emotions in God. Well, that I'm, I'm about to get preaching on something I'm not even supposed to be going there tonight. I got a whole other subject matter, but uh, God's been good. He's been awesome. He's been mighty, so we thank Him uh, for His grace and His mercy. Let's bow. Father, awesome you are, mighty you are, and uh, we can't thank you enough. But still, we say thank you. We can't praise you enough, but right now we praise you. You're awesome. We praise you. You are mighty. We praise you. You are great. Your word says that you are great and greatly to be praised. So uh, there's no name above your name, and we know that tonight, God. We bless you. There's no one like you. You are unique. You are God all by yourself, and all by yourself, you are God. So we bless your name tonight. Thank you for the strength of the day. Thank you for keeping us through whatever we had to do today. We glorify you because we know that you did it. Our going out, our coming in, or in some cases, God just our dwelling in today. You, you kept us. So we said thank you today. Now would you help us to to hear what you say to us tonight through your word? We want to be hearers and doers of your word. We want to be more aware of what your word is saying to our lives. God, help me. I am weak, but you are strong. Edify your people now. Glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, then. Listen, 
we will remind you that we do post our notes for each um, lesson, you know, lesson Bible study time on our Facebook uh, DBC Tacoma page. We do put the notes there. We just make, try to make sure we get those to you there before uh, the broadcast starts so that you can get those down and uh, have something to write on, write on, along with other things that we, we talk about uh, in each lesson. So uh, hopefully you've had a chance to get those. If you have, then you can go to Facebook, uh, Facebook DBC, DBC Tacoma Facebook and get those notes. Uh, matter of fact, um, you might want to, if you haven't done it, consider maybe just having a notebook where you keep your notes in, have reference to go back. It's, it's okay to go back with reference your notes and stuff. It's good. I tell people all the time, and I know it's true, that we can't remember everything we've heard. Sometimes something sounds good to us or whatever, and um, we don't do something with it right away, and it'll fade. But if we got notes, if we can, if we kind of remember where they are in the notes, we can always go back and, and get a hold of them and, and read them and refresh our remem our memory, memory, yeah, refresh our uh, memory and uh, be encouraged once again in what we've learned. So get those notes. We try to make those uh, accessible to you to help you in your walk. And they're always good to go back when you're talking to somebody else too. Uh, about the Word of God, about the life God has called us to live. And you can always redirect people back to the broadcast because they're there um, online, again, for uh, to be watched, uh, to be um, re-listened to um, more than just one time, okay? So anyway, let's, let's move in. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We have talked about this church being a, a church that had a lot of stuff going on, a lot of issues going on, and so it was a letter of correction. And so now we, we, we find Paul uh, moving into uh, a subject matter that we need to be aware of ourselves, a subject matter that was going on in the church, and the problem was the church uh, knew of it, but wasn't nobody doing nothing about it. They knew of it, but nobody was doing anything about it. Okay, so we, we call this, we call this tonight, Addressing Sin in the Church. Addressing Sin in the Church. Let me just go in and let's talk about how, uh, to see how Paul addresses this issue of sin in the church. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and uh, we're going to begin reading at verse one, I'm going to give you the, <clears throat> I'm going to give you the, the, the idea that we, we can get from this. Uh, the church, the need for church discipline was being ignored by the church. The need for church discipline was being ignored by the church. Some, sometimes we think that word discipline doesn't belong in the church, but it does. <laughs> anyway, the need for dis church discipline was being ignored by the church. Let's read. It is actually reported there are sexual there is sexual immorality among you as such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. And in my version, I'm reading basically from the New King James, it has an exclamation point exclamation point. Paul says, I've, I've, been, I've been told that there is sexual immorality among you, and th this sexual immorality, even the, the Gentiles, those that don't know who, who God is, that those who don't acknowledge God, they don't practice this stuff. They don't practice it. He says that a man has his father's wife. This is uh, this his father's wife. Then that would be his father's wife and so the woman would be this man's stepmother stepmother we don't know all the occasion of what went on there but we do know that this this his father has uh <clears throat> married remarried we don't know the situation but this is what we do know that this man was having a relationship with his father's his father's wife, this would have been his stepmother, and Paul calls it sexual immorality, sexual immorality. We'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more down here uh, in the lesson, but this is what's going on. He says uh, that a man has his mother's, 
his mother's wife. Listen to listen to uh, what the uh, Old Testament text. Um, God gave this this uh, prohibition in the book of Leviticus. Um, Leviticus six and and I'm sorry, Leviticus eighteen and six. I'm gonna read this from the NIV. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Here now is the standard that God puts down here and uh, in, in giving this to the children of Israel. Okay. But then he says in verse 8, I'm going to skip down to verse 8. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your dishonor your father. The scripture Paul talks, I think, about to the church at uh, Thessalonica about not having sex with someone who is not your 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 spouse because in doing so you dishonor the person or you you commit fraud i think the word is from the person who they were who they will eventually marry so here in leviticus it says that you would dishonor your your father uh this is what we call this is a form of uh incest this is a form of incest okay family relations here it's a form of incest <clears throat> This this is probably why Paul put the, the exclamation point here on on, on uh, verse one. I'm gonna read some more. Uh, verse one, uh, he puts that exclamation point because listen, um, as 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 messed up as the city of Corinth was. Remember, this was a Greek culture. They had a whole bunch of stuff going on in Corinth. They had um, temples of prostitutes. They had all kinds of gods. They were worshiping all kinds of stuff. You know, they had the philosophies of life and stuff. As as much as Corinth had going on, ungodly stuff they were doing, they were not participating in this activity. As a matter of fact, my understanding is this activity was, was, was illegal under Roman law. Under Roman law, the incest, the, the son sleeping with his father's wife, that was against Roman law. And Paul says here that I have been told that there's stuff going on among you that the Gentiles don't participate in. And that is that a man is having sex with his father's wife. So Paul is kind of put out on that because he has that exclamation point. But then as you go on and read verse 3, he said, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as I am absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. He said, you puffed up. You, 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 you walking around like everything cool. There's an air of pride here. And what's going on? You ought to be mourning. He says, you ought to be mourning. This ought to be bothering you. But y'all puffed up. Y'all got this pride attitude. Attitude some y'all. Y'all listen it. Y'all talking about it. But y'all ain't talking to him about it. Okay. Listen. Um, what he says here later on to them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, talking about love, talking about love. Um, from the NIV, NIV, he says, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love does not delight in evil. Love does not approve of any kind of evil. Um, but delights in truth. De love, if you would, does not delight or approve of any sin. Love does not approve of sin in the believer's life. Love doesn't do that because love wants the best uh, for the person love. Love is about being concerned about the well-being of another person. And he he says here that uh, you're not mourning over this. You, 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 you're puffed up. You, you, you're delighting in this stuff. Okay, now I want to um, make sure that we get this. This act, this sinful activity, because it comes to Paul here, is known is known through the congregation. I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit too. Okay, known through the congregation. So this is not he said, she said. This is not juicy, uh, pew gossip. This is a known fact that this man is sleeping with his father's wife. Now it's interesting. Paul doesn't talk about 
uh, the woman, he really here deals with the man. Well, that could be, that could be because maybe the woman was not a, 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 a member of the congregation. Okay. Uh, she she was not involved in the congregation, so he doesn't bring her up. He deals with the, the the son here because this son is a part, a member of the of the congregation. So it's known what this son is doing, and Paul is is I, we could say today put out. You know he's displeased. He he's Paul. He's displeased over what's going on. And he says, instead of mourning over what's going on, this is tragic. This is tragic going on in church. He says that you're, you're puffed up. This don't even bother you. This does not even bother you. So he says in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of Jesus Christ. He says something heavy duty here. He says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is strong stuff here, y'all. This is strong stuff. He says, um, you ought to be, if you would, uh, you ought to be concerned uh, you'll be shaming of yourself that you 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 you're, you're not bothered by what's going on here. That you're taking this lightly, he says. And this is the instruction that he gives. Listen to this. He says, uh, when you gather together, this is like have a special gathering, have a special gathering, if you would. This wouldn't be your normal uh, Sunday morning gathering. This is a special gathering. And he says, when you come together, this is the purpose of your coming together, to deliver or turn uh, such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Deliver, this is a judicial term, judicial sisting, I'm so, uh, sentencing, I'm sorry. And this is equal to, this is like excommuning, excommunicating the believer uh, from participating in the life of the church. That's that's how serious Paul is about this. We'll see why in a little bit. Okay. He says, turn him over. Don't, don't allow him to participate in the communal life, the communal life of the church. Now there is um, uh, a couple of references I'm going to give you. Okay. About this, uh, the structure of flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Let me, let me give you a couple here. Um, there can be divine chastening for sin that can result in illness and even death. God, when God divinely chastens us, here Paul says, turn him over to uh, destruction of the flesh, turn him over to Satan. If things not go, destruction of the flesh. In 1 Corinthians, later on, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Down in verses 29 and 32, Paul says that you are, you're not coming to the communion table, the, the Lord's Supper, the communion table the right way. You, you, you're not treating each other right in coming to the table. You are, therefore, you're coming, listen to the table with sin, and, and, and you're not repentant of your sin. I'll, I'll deal with that repentance in a little bit too. And so Paul says, because of the way you are coming, God is judging you. He's doing judging he's judging you by the way you're coming and he says that because of this some of you are sick and some of you are dying divine now he's talking to the church divine judgment sin sin in the believer's life can bring divine i'm not trying to scare you i'm just trying to tell you what scripture says okay sin sin in the life of a believer is a serious matter also, we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, which is one of my favorite texts sometime to use. I haven't used it in a while, where a man by Ananias and Sapphira sold a possession. And when they came to church, because they were supposed to be selling a possession, bringing the proceeds to the church to help the poor, when they sold the possession, uh, they decided to not, uh, to 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 lie about how much they got for it, and so they sold the possession, and the scripture said they kept back a part of it. So Ananias got to church. I call it that Sunday morning, 
And he came down offering time. And Peter said, Ananias, tell me, uh, did you sell this for so-and-so? He said, yeah, pastor. He said, I sold it. And here's the proceeds. And, and Peter said, why have you lied to the Spirit, the Spirit of God? You not lied to men, but to God. The Spirit of God told Peter this. Woo, the, the Spirit of God told Peter Ananias was lying. I, I don't want to be too long here because this is a preach. Um, he told Peter he was lying. And he said, uh, why have you lied to God? You not lied to men, but you lied to God. And the scripture said that when Peter said you lied to God, um, that Ananias, I'm just trying to uh, paraphrase it, dropped dead on the spot. Some young men came in and carried his body out. Afternoon, late, Sister Sapphira, Sister Sapphira, she, you know, she had to get herself together to come to church. So she comes to church later. She comes. I don't know how late she, late she was. I used to say this was afternoon service, whatever it was. But she comes to church later. She don't even know, don't even notice that her husband is not there. I don't know what the, anyway. Peter says, ooh, Sister Sapphira, you tell me, did you and your husband sell the, the, the uh, parcel for so-and-so? She said, yeah, Brother Pastor, we sure did. And uh, that here, here's the proceed. You just see, you, this is what we got for it. And Peter said to her, why have you conspired with your husband to lie to God? He said, the same people who carried your husband out is coming to get you. And the scripture says that when he said that she dropped dead on the spot, divine judgment. Oh my goodness. And the same, the same young men who carried, uh, Ananias out, carries the fire out too. Divine sin is, and many times as believers, we don't, we don't take sin seriously. It's, it's just, it, it, we cheapen God's grace. We cheapen God's grace. Oh, well, I did this. God going to forgive me. That's a cheapening of his grace. Okay. So Paul, when he says here, he says that turn him over to Satan, excommunicate him. Um, he, 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 he can't participate. I'm just telling you what it says here. Can't participate in the body life uh, of the church. He says, turn them, turn them over, turn them over. Let Satan have them. Don't, uh, remove the covering, the church covering. Let Satan have him, okay? For the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the, in the day uh, of the Lord Jesus, and, okay? So really, the idea here is, is for repentance. We want this brother to repent. Want him to repent. Want, want him to repent, Okay, and, but some there are times. Let me talk to you. I got to go on there, and I'm gonna tell you this. Um, if we go through this. There are times when people won't listen to people, so God has to get involved. People won't listen to God's people, so people have to get involved. But let me let me move on because I kind of I kind of went over to where um, <clears throat> where I wanted to get to. Okay, where I want to get to here. Um, listen, Jesus gave guidelines. I wanna. He gave some guidelines on how this should should be. Okay, he gave some guidelines on how to do the the disciplining uh, of a, a church member who who is in sin. He says, in uh, Matthew eighteen, he says, starting in verse fifteen. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. They they listen. They sinned against you. He says here, if he sins against you, against you. Go talk to them privately. And if they, basically, if he hears you, you've gained your brother. That means if they repent, you've gained your brother. That's as far as it goes. It, it, it happened between you and them. It gets set up between you and them. It's good. Okay? It's good. You're all good. Listen. But if he will not hear, verse 16, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now they won't listen to you. So you get some other people to go with you. You don't persuade them to your side of the story. You just say, well, this is what happened. This is what I did. And so now we need to go and try to restore the brother. I, I want to be restored to the brother. We want the brother to be restored to God because sin means you're out of fellowship with God. Okay. So now you take two or three witnesses. Okay. Uh, that the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now there's other people who, um, who have tried along with you to get this brother to turn away from or, 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 or repent 
uh, seek forgiveness of what they've done. Now, now listen, if it if it happens in verse um, if it happens in verse sixteen, good. But when you you don't need to go any further. Verse seventeen, I says, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. In other words, um, the idea would be. Um, Tell it to the church. Get the church praying. Get the church praying. This, boy, we don't we don't want to do this. Get the church praying. People don't want it. We scared of this. We tell, well, what's gonna happen? Uh, get the church praying. Get the church praying. This is not about slanderizing the person. This is trying to get the person to repent. Get the church praying. I'm not gonna try to go into the whole thing here, but get the church praying. Listen to this. But if he refuses to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a task. A tax collector. Wow. If he refuses to listen, if he refuses to listen, okay, then let them be like a heathen and a tax collector. Let them be like a Gentile. Let them be like one who does not know the Lord. And I remember what Paul said. Paul said to excommunicate them. This, this don't mean that you don't love them. It just means that you, the, the ways, the ways that they're into and they're not uh, 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 listening to come out of their ways, he says, treat them like a tax collector and a heathen. Treat them like somebody who doesn't know God. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to, you, you stop praying for them because we are, the prayer ought to be in the whole thing. But realize this is where they are. And listen to this. Listen why, listen to this. This is where they are and they're not listening. They're not listening. Okay, and that's what Paul said earlier, turn him over to, to the devil because if, if God, can, God can use the enemy to get to you. That's a good one. God can use the enemy to get to you. There's nothing that God, uh, there's nothing that God, nowhere that God's lack in getting to you. So he says, then he says, assuredly, I say to you on verse 18, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth and be loosened. Now, please notice this is about, this is about uh, the judgment of this brother. But please understand, the reason uh, earth, uh, heaven will bind what you bind on earth is because heaven, heaven is already bound. And see, what you're doing, you're acting under the authority of heaven. You're not acting on your own authority. And whatever you loose on earth, uh, will be loosed in heaven when you act, when you loose it. So if a man refuses, uh, if, if a man refuses to uh, to listen, then you're saying your sins are on you because you refuse to live because that's what heaven says. But if a man listens, then you could say you've been loosed from your sin because heaven looses them from their sin. Okay. So Jesus gives us a format, and then when we go to Galatians. Uh, chapter 6. This is what should have been happening in the church at Corinth. This is what should have been happening in the church at Corinth. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, Galatians 6 and 1, New, Le New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, spiritual, should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path and be careful not to fall in the same temptation yourself. Okay, remember earlier, uh, I told you what Paul said in First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8, out of the New Living, I mean, sorry, NIV, uh, love does not rejoice in evil, but love rejoices in the truth. Love does not um, uh, say it's okay to sin, but love uh, rejoices in those people who are walking Right. Listen to what he says here. Gently help that person back onto the right path, back on the right path. That's what they should have been doing. And then he says also, uh, be careful not to fall into the same temptation. In other words, don't think yourself above what you're trying to help this other person out of. OK, so listen. So the aim of addressing sin is restoration. The aim of addressing sin is restoration. Not listen to this, not undressing the person. Tell them how bad they are. Tell them how jacked up they are. Tell them how uh, Paul says, "Be careful, you know, fall in the same temptation." Tell them how 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 you would never do what they've done. That no, don't. If that's your attitude, don't go because he says in Galatians, "Godly spiritual, godly spiritual." Consider yourself godly spiritual. 
So you don't go in a condemning, judging, looking down on them attitude. You go with the idea of, of restoration because um, that's what we need to be after. So when Paul says, put them out, listen, uh, excommunicate and put them out, um, Jesus gave a format for doing that. Jesus gave a format for doing that. And Paul says over Galatians, we're supposed to go after them. We're supposed to talk to them about coming out of their sin. That's part of our our calling as the body of Christ. As, as children of God, we're supposed to be watching out for each other. That's part of what we should be doing. Okay? So, so, um, <clears throat> so then, um, the, the need for a church discipline was being ignored by the church. And, and, and too often the need for church discipline is being ignored by the church today. There ain't nobody saying nothing. Ain't nobody saying nothing, nothing about nothing. Ain't nobody saying nothing about nothing. See, this was known. This was known, but nobody was saying anything. Listen, um, let me make sure I get this in because I got to go. People say, well, the church is, is a hospital uh, for the sick. Yes, absolutely. It's a hospital. It's a hospital for the sick. But listen, let me tell you what that falls down is people don't people don't go to the hospital to stay sick. People go to the hospital to get help to overcome the sickness. So while the church is a hospital for the sick, the spiritually sick, they, not, they should not be going there to stay in that same spiritual condition. They should be going there to get support, help, so they can walk the way God would have them to walk. Okay, all right, see, listen, listen. If you got lung cancer, they tell you got lung cancer. They tell you got lung cancer from smoking. And they're gonna, they bring you into the hospital and say, we're going to treat lung cancer. You don't sit up there in the hospital and you keep on smoking. No. Because you keep on smoking, you're working con contrary to the help that you they're trying to get. Okay? Contrary to the help. So yes, the church is a hospital for the sick, but people don't go to the hospital to stay sick. People go in to the hospital with the desire of getting getting well, getting better. Okay. All right. Let me go on. I got to go. Uh, so why is addressing sin in the church important? Why is that so important? Well, here we go. First uh, Corinthians five verses six through eight. I'll give it to you. Then I'm going to read unaddressed sin has the potential to permeate and corrupt the whole local church. Uh, verse six says, uh, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little, a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You're glorying. You're not doing about about this. You're boasting of it. You're uh, you're not talking. You you might be talking about them, but not to them. All this other stuff. You know what's going on, but you're not doing anything about it. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Uh, Paul said again in Galatians five and nine the same thing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. What about this leaven thing? Leaven or yeast? Is is used to make bread dough rise. It influences the bread dough to rise. You put just a little bit. Of, it don't take a lot, but that little that you put in influences the whole dough of bread to rise. Is what um, they do. Bakeries, or whatever. Some of y'all have made bread from scratch at home, perhaps. And you, you, you. Uh, I mean, when you're really serious about making, you put all the ingredients in there. You mix the the yeast, the leaven in there, and what you do is you let it set for a while. And that ball that you, uh, or whatever the shape was that you made, it rises. It gets bigger. Why? Because the leaven has an influence on on that on that dough of bread. It has an influence on that dough. Not a whole lot of leaven. But a, whole, a little bit of leaven has a whole lot of influence. A little bit of leaven has a whole lot of influence. Listen to this. In scripture, uh, leaven was often a symbol of evil or of, of sin. Jesus even warned uh, his listeners in Matthew uh, 16, uh, 6 and 16 and, and also in Mark. Mark quotes, I believe Luke does too. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Take heed of the sinful ways. 
sinful ways. They're not, they might not be blatant and big, 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 take heed of the sinful ways of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Listen, so, so as a little leaven has an influential effect on bread dough, listen to this, so unaddressed sin can have an influential effect on the church. As, as yeast leaven is used to have an effect on the dough, listen to this, unaddressed, unaddressed sin can have an influential effect on the church. Let me just give it to you. When known sin is not addressed in the church, others can conclude that it's okay to live a sinful lifestyle. People know somebody's sinning and nobody's sinning about it. This is a known thing. Nobody's saying anything about it. Well, some somebody else might get that. Oh, well, it's okay for them to do it. I, I can I can I can do it too. When when there's family uh, <clears throat> family um, situations come up, when um, the, the 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 standards of the family are there, and one of the children breaks the standard, if mama and daddy don't say nothing about them breaking the standard, then the other kids will get the idea it's okay for me to break the standard too, because they mama and daddy they're just making noise, ain't nothing going on ain't nothing going on after they make the noise so uh sinful listen sinful behavior in the church when not addressed this is good i just thought this just now thank you holy spirit sinful behavior in the church that is not addressed has the potential to begat begat <laughs> sinful nature Sinful behavior in the church. Sinful, sinful behavior in the church, when not addressed, has the potential to beget more sinful behavior in the church. It's that influence. Listen, a um, while ago, I can't remember who he was, um, but I was listening to um, a, um, a speaker talk about issues of the church and how he was ministering at this church. He went to this church and ministered to the church. And after he had ministered, one of the deacons came to him and said, I, I, I want you to pray for me. Uh, I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through a divorce and I really want you to pray for me. And so as, as the, um, the speaker was talking to the man, he said, I need you to pray for me. He said, um, and I also need you to pray for the other deacons at our church because they are going through or have gotten divorced also. And so the speaker said to the guy at that time, he says, and what has your pastor said about this? And the guy said to the speaker, well, pastor got divorced too. Did you, did you catch all that? Okay. Okay for pastor to get divorced. Now, there, no, there are, there are, there are, extenuating circumstances, infidelity, you know, infidelity. Jesus did give that as a, as a permissionable reason to get divorced. We uh, talked about uh, desertion, uh, people who, who desert um, the family, the home, the spouse, okay? We, we could see that in the scripture, but listen, sometimes divorce is just about, we can't, we, I don't want to do this no more. I don't found me somebody else. I won't do this no more. And when you have, listen, when you have the pastor of the church who is supposed to be the, listen, the pace setter, when you have the pastor of the church who's supposed to be the pace setter, uh, in this case, uh, he had gotten a divorce. Don't know what the details were, but that was a signal to everybody else in church to get, to get a divorce too. So even the deacons who are supposed to be the support of the church and, 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 and um, carrying out what the church needs to be doing as far as the pastor was directing. It was getting divorced too. Because let me tell you something, a little leaven, a little sin in the church unaddressed, okay, can permeate through the whole church. So you can have a church, uh, you can have people in the church not living holy, not living that we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about living out of God's will. Okay. And ain't nobody saying nothing to nobody. It can be contagious. A sin can be now we already we already had a sin issue, okay? 
but sin in the church and nobody saying anything about it, it not being addressed, it not trying to uh, get people to, to be restored to God, come out of that sin, it can send a signal that it's okay. Hear the word of God, but it's okay. Come to church, it's okay. Go on, do what you're going to do, it's okay. So there, there is the destructiveness. And, and remember this, remember this. Uh, people look for the church to, for the most part, people look for the church to be different, especially when it comes to morality. Now, they don't want you, they don't want you dictating your morality to them, but they're looking for something different in the church. And if people see in the church saying stuff in the world, that, that's, that's an that's a, uh, 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 image issue that makes the church look bad. Nobody's saying anything. Again, it's not about anybody being better than anybody else. You know, matter of fact, Jesus did say, get the beam out your eye before you help your brother get the, the splinter out of his eye. But we're supposed to be looking out for each other because sin can be rampant in a church because nobody is saying anything. It's not my business. Well, it's family business. It's family. That's your brother, your sister in Christ. That's family business. That's what God would have you to do. If you love me, listen, if you love me, check me. Now, love me, check me. And I don't mean act stupid. I mean just love me, check me. And if I don't receive what you're saying, that's not on you. That's on me. But sin could be pervasive in the church. I, I've, anyway, let me go on because I, I don't want to get over there. I got a little bit more I need to talk to you about. Let, let, let me get on. Okay. So he, he, he goes on to say uh, in verse 7, let me come back. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verse, verse 7. He says, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leavened bread of sincerity in, in truth. Listen, um, uh, let, me, let me just do it this way. In the Passover celebration, back in Exodus 12, 1 through 27, it should be a note there for you. The lamb was sacrificed. And yeast free bread was eaten when God gave the, uh, uh, the uh, instructions to Moses about how he was going to bring them out of Israel, how he was going to deliver them, set them, I'm sorry, out of Egypt to the Israelites, how he was going to free them out of Egypt, to deliver them out of Egypt. They were to um, 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 shed, uh, put the blood of the lamb over the the doorpost, the Passover, and when the blood of the lamb was over the doorpost, the death angel would pass over that home, but also they were to prepare unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is bread with no leaven in it. It doesn't rise. Remember, leaven was uh, off time looking, we're looking through scripture now. They were to, the unleavened bread then was uh, being signification or signified, no, no sin. The blood was over the doorpost, but the bread had to be unleavened. Okay, so uh, that's what they did. It was a celebration, and that's that's what they did, and they celebrated that over and over again. The Passover was about when God freed his people from Egypt. And uh, part of it, though, was the unleavened bread was in there, but it was 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 to be eaten. Unleavened bread couldn't have yeast in it. Okay, now listen to this. Um, <clears throat> Christ, the Lamb of God, in the Old Testament, it was the Passover Lamb that was slain. Christ, the Lamb of God, John 1, 21, 29, became our Passover to purge us from sin. The Passover in the Old Testament was the lamb that gave his life. The Passover in the New Testament is Jesus who gave his life. So when Paul talks about the Passover, when he talks about the unleavened, the unleavened, symbolic of sin, he says, he says our, Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us back in seven. Therefore, let us Keep the feast not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. What is the leaven of malice and wickedness? That's sin. But when the unleavened bread, purity, 
without leaven, without sin, of sincerity and truth. And truth. Remember, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, a little sin. So we're not supposed to be walking in sin now. We're supposed to be walking in the truth of God and the righteousness of of God, sincerity and truth. Okay? So it's important then <clears throat> to understand the potential that sin has to run through a church. And Paul said, it don't take much. It don't take much. People see somebody getting away with something, they think they can get away with it too. Don't take much. So, he says here, um, if you would, when I go down here to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, patterns of Patterns of sin by believers need to be addressed. I, I want to give that to you, okay? He says, verse 9, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with sexual immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, idolaters since then you would have to, you would need to go out of the world. So apparently Paul wrote on this subject before in a letter letter he had sent to them, he said, I wrote to you about this. He said, but when I wrote to you about this, he says, these particular areas, I was not talking about people in the world because the only way you would not have anything to do with them was you'd have to leave the world because it's everywhere. When we look around, we see sin everywhere. The only way we could not have anything to do with people in sin would be to leave the world. But Jesus wanted us as his disciples to be in the world when Jesus prayed in John 17, 15, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We got that phrase in the world, but not of in the world, but not of the world. Um, so, but they misunderstood his directions. When he wrote that, they thought he was talking about people in the world. So, Listen, he said, I did not mean with them. But when you get to verse 11, he says, but now I have written to you to make it written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother. So what he's saying is, I want to make sure you understand this. Make sure you understand this, that I'm writing to you to make it plain that you should not keep a company with anyone named a brother. Now, I'm just going to go through this. First, who is sexually immoral. That goes back to the brother. First, it goes back to the son, okay, who was sleeping with his father's wife. Sexually immoral. Let me just give you a few things here. Any sexual activity outside of that which is between a husband and a wife. And sometimes we have to make sure there's a, a man born a man and a woman born a woman. A husband and a wife. Marriage. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Sexual immoral, any sexual activity outside of that which is between a husband and wife, okay? That's the mandate from God, okay? Or covetous. Covetous is greed, is being totally unsatisfied with what we already have is greed, is the, is the, the desire, the lust for more, not satisfied, not content. Jesus said in, in Luke 12 and 15, uh, and he, Jesus said to them, take heed and be aware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses, the things he he possesses possessions covetousness covetousness greed possessions okay then he also says or oh, an idolater now i'm going through these hopefully you got your notes okay one who worships shows allegiance to anything other than God, one who worships, serves, or shows allegiance to anything other than God. In Exodus 20 and 3, 
God said to the Israelites before they went into the promised land, you shall have no other gods before me. And that, that phrase, no other gods before me, alongside of me or in my place. Nothing before me or in my place. I got a quote there in your notes. Uh, it says, today the idols which enslave men are the idols of the consumer society. Our society is a society that is highly based on uh, 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 being consumers, consumers, buying, buying, going after what we see, buying, 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 going after what we see. So uh, while uh, one day, a long time ago, they made their idols out of trees or whatever. Our idols are manufactured today. They're put before us and say, you got to have this. You got to you got to you, you got to want this. You got to have this because they want you to have it, want you to want it enough enough to convince you that you got to have it. Then you go after it. Idolatry, he says, he says, people who uh who who are, are deep into idolatry? Be careful about those folks. Okay, L listen. Got to go on. Um, listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Um, in I want to show you this idolatry and covetousness in Colossians three and five is interesting. What Paul says to the church there, he says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication that would be sexual immorality, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Please notice what he does here. He's, he hooks covetousness and idolatry together. He says that covetousness, greed then, is idolatry. Greed, idolatry. Idolatry is having something uh, more important to you than God. Greed. Uh, possessions, having stuff, have, your stuff could be more important to you than God. Greed, which is Okay, produces I, idolatry. Then he says, or a reviler, one who is abusive with her tongue. Uh, wow, assassinates people character with their tongue. They're, they're non-paid verbal critical reviewers of people's lives. <laughs> Gossips. James says in James chapter 3, uh, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among its members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. It's devil inspired. Then he says in verse 8 of James 3, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison, a reviler. I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing where we're seeing that more and more of, of um, these cut downs and these things in politics today than, than I've, I've known in a long time. Of course, it's everywhere. But every time I look around, I'm, I'm hearing a, a, a politician reviling another politician or reviling people. Let me go on there because I ain't going to mention no names. Okay. Or a drunkard, a person who is habitually drunk, a person who is habitually drunk. Uh, <laughs> Ephesians 5 and 18 says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. New Living Translation. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. What's the problem with drunkenness? When you're drunk, then the drunk is talking, uh, not the person. The Spirit, that's the wrong spirit. Drunkenness puts the wrong spirit in you. And that wrong spirit in you now, the drink, they say the drink controls what a person says and what a person does. So don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Or an extortioner, uh, the practice of attaining something, especially money through force or threats. And then he says, not even to eat with such a person. The meal was a sign of acceptance and fellowship in those days. You see, hanging out with people who are, who are, who are hanging out with believers who who are perpetually sinning, you know, over and over and again sinning, uh, can be, they could see that as condoning or saying it's okay, that their behavior is okay. Now listen, listen. Here's the thing. Um, Jesus hung out with sinners. Listen to this. But Jesus didn't condone their sin. As a matter of fact, when you, when you, when you uh, look at Jesus and Zac Zac uh, Zacchaeus, 
uh, Jesus invited himself to Zac Zacchaeus' house. But you know what happened to Zacchaeus' house? He got saved. He repented. Okay? He, he, he repented and said, I would, he says, I repent. He said, I will restore. If I take anything from anybody, I will restore it fourfold. Okay, Jesus was at the house of, of Simon the leper. Simon invited him to dinner. But Jesus had a, a conversation with Simon while they were having dinner. And uh, while Simon had that critical spirit, Jesus called him out and said, let me tell you how you have you treated me opposed, as opposed to this woman treated me. So please understand, what Jesus did was he took the occasion to, to, to deal with the sin. Deal with the sin. So listen, listen. Um, this eating with people, um, you need to be addressing their sin so that they don't think that you hanging out with them is condoning or saying it's okay. It's not okay. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say this to you. A lot of times when you tell people they ain't okay, they don't want to eat you with you anyway. They don't want to have nothing to do with you because every time they, you're going to remind them of the sin. But understand this. Jesus did. He, he ate with sinners, but the issue of him hating with, eating with sinners was he was eating with sinners to get them right, not just to say, ho, ho, we're having a good time together. All right? Let me, let me, let me go on here. So the last one, verses 12 and 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, <clears throat> I'll give it to you. The church's business is to address the practice of sin behavior of those in the church. Okay, listen, Paul says, for what have I to do with the judgment of those who are outside, outside who are outside the church? Do you not judge those who are inside? You should be. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. First Peter 4, 17 says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins uh, with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? L listen, uh, sometimes uh, safe folk are so busy trying to police the world, telling the world what they're doing wrong and not talking to each other about what they're doing wrong. We're, we're not called to police society. Society is not going to change when we, because we talk about them. What we need to be doing is policing ourselves. Listen to this. I use the word police. We, you, we need to be checking ourselves within the body of Christ so that we, the body of Christ will become more attractive to the world. We are supposed to judge that word, judge each other, uh, coming out of um, um, what we've been saying before. We're trying to, we're trying to get them on the right track. Get, get each other on the right track. Keep each other on the right track. That's what we need to be focusing on. And we're supposed to be a light. Yes, we're supposed to be a light to the world, but the world got to be something different in us. We can't be just condemning and talk. We're so busy condemning and talking about what the world doing. The world is centered. That they're doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, they they're doing what they're supposed to do. God's word, the New Testament, is giving to His people on how to live, and we're trying to take how what the word says, how we're supposed to live, and, and make the world uh, live by that. And we ain't living by the word ourselves, so we need to be concerned about the sinning brother and sister. We need to be saying something to them, encouraging them to live in God because in the church we need to be careful because if ain't nothing said people will think they can live any kind of way and they should not have that attitude so we need to be concerned about addressing sin among God's people with the idea of restoration not putting them down not beating them over the head but idea of restoration because we don't want to misrepresent God even in the church. Father, we bless you for your word. Help us to um, take your word in first uh, for ourselves, to check ourselves that we are not persistently living out of your will. And brother, Father, I pray that we will have the courage and the uh, spiritual discernment that when we see a brother or a sister who is uh, not living the way you have them to live, God, that we would, uh, by the power of your spirit, seek to restore them to you, that they would understand that the way they're living 
um, needs to be changed so you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, again, bless you. So glad you came out to be with us today. Whatever time of day it is that you're getting this, our God is awesome. Our God is mighty. Our God is great.